Welcome back to part four of our six part series. And for this portion, we're going to go over the dye sublimation process, the calendar heat press. My name is Lily Hunter with Roland DGA. And Mike Sanders with TVF. All right, so let's go over what we're going to talk about um, in this portion of the webinar. Uh, we're going to look at the importance of proper settings on your calendar press and we're also going to look at common dye sublimation issues and causes. So this isn't just so much the calendar press, but we're also going to see how the fabrics play into it because there have been situations where Mike has said, you know, he'll sell the same fabric to a couple different people and the way they process it on their calendar can yield totally different results. So one can go through beautifully and the other, the way that it's processed through the calendar press can have shrinkage issues or other things. And this is beyond the right. color issue. Right. And you don't want to, you know, if you go, if I go into a place and they say, well, we run everything on the heat press or the calendar, all at the same setting. Well, that's when you got to start, start over completely. Every fabric needs its own setting. Right. Yes, some may be, may, may be almost exactly the same, but you need to know that. Mm -hmm. and the only way to know that is to test it properly, and we'll get into that as we get going. Right, and, and this is where I always tell people, especially those who are learning or starting off, is to have like a journal and document. Um, it is so important. You want to get things dialed in as soon as possible for the, the fabric, for the press. So what I tell people to do is, starting with printing, write down the temperature, the environment temperature, the humidity level, um, you know, even if you need to put the lot numbers of your inks and things of that nature, write it down. And then when you take it to the heat press, write down the settings of the heat press. Yes. And, and from there, you know, when it yields that right the right results that you want, you have it documented. And you're, you're note, noting also the type of fabric, too, and the lot number of the fabric. Right. One thing you really want to do, anything that you're running, fabric-wise, the ticket in the roll tells the lot number, the roll number, and any, anybody that has a ticket on their machine should be able to tell you everything about that fabric, how it was done, by having the ticket information. Right, this is for the TVF roles. TVF, and it is mo and hopefully and most places have the right. lot number if they, if somewhere they don't, on the label. Then, then they're not the right supplier for you. Right, so and always have that lot number of the fabrics. And have them the write that down. And, yes. Because if there's ever a problem, you can give that to the fabric supplier and they can tell you everything about that role to be able to get the, whatever the problem is fixed so you know what the issue is. Right, because you know, when you have Say you get a great result, and this is your control sample, your, your retain, and you want to hit the same colors and everything, and you're using the same fabrics, you're going through all the same settings, and now something is off. And we're trying to pinpoint, is it the printer? Is it the inks? Is it this? Is it that? And the more information you have, um, and the lot numbers, then we can try trace it down and see, is it a process issue? Is it the fabric? Is, did something happen? Right. Is it from so. the same lot? Is it from a different lot? Right. These are all things that can cause issues. So by doing that, sometimes somebody will be running a fabric and they run it all the time. It's run 20, you know, 24 seven, right. pretty much. But some of a sudden they, they get a roll that was in the back corner mm -hmm. that's been there for two years. Right, stored in, wrapped up in the and bag. And it doesn't do the same as what the other, and all of a sudden, well, yeah, because that's not from the same lot, and it's right. been there for a long period of time. Right, it wasn't can, conditioned. Yeah, and, and then there can be issues. So the one thing is, is having the consistencies and setting up systems, and especially setting up systems on your calendar heat press mm -hmm. to make sure you keep the consistency. Once you've done that, it works fine. Right. If there's anything that varies, it's going to vary how the outcome is. Right. I've seen times too where uh, a place that runs a lot of production will have multiple shifts, mm -hmm. and we find out that the guy on the night shift runs it completely different. He changes mm. the settings on the machine. That should not be left to anybody on the machine. Once you, we've, we've gone through what we're showing you how to set up, once we set that up, you have that in writing. Mm -hmm. Lots of times we'll put charts on there right. that, of the fabrics with the settings on there right. that everybody, nobody freelances. Yes, it's calendar. dialed in. So. And we're trying to save you um, 
from headaches and heartaches and frustration and wasting money, yeah. you know, if, if we can just try to do this up front. So, all right, done with that soapbox. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go on a different soapbox now. Calendar Press. There are multiple, multiple manufacturers out there. And I have three um, just showing right there. We have one um, by Cleverick. That's the top left one. That's actually what we have here at Roland. And then um, the bottom middle, that's a Monte Antonio. So you'll always hear from people, I have a Monte or a Cleverick. So these are your like top-notch, high-end you know, quality is going to last a lifetime, and you know, yeah, if you, you get can it. get into it, this is it. Yeah, you, I always tell people, if you have a Cleaver or a Monty, you'll have it. You can pass that down to your kids. Yeah. They'll still be running. I mean, the only thing you ever have to change out of them is the belt. The belt, yeah. So, you I mean, it if, you, if you maintain it right and you treat it right, it'll last forever. And if your kids don't want to get in the business and you have to sell it, guess what? It's Great the easiest one value. to sell. So there's certain there are certain machines that you have no problem getting rid of. Like Cleavick or Monte, you can usually get rid right, of them pretty, right. mu pretty much any time. Yes, the resale. And then the top right um, is a product by um, AIT. Yep. And what's different about this one, which you can also get on the Cleavick or the Monte, is that feeding table. And what that is, it's for um, cut and sew um, type of process instead of doing roll to roll. Right. So as you can see in the image, you have a pattern for say a, a jersey and and so you're just pretty much going to be matching cut pieces of fabric onto um, those prints or some people actually print it through the whole roll and then cut afterwards right. but for something like this usually you're adding pieces. And then also mm -hmm. this could be going into another line where you have a cutter mm -hmm. that's actually going to cut out the pieces right. automatically so these are different lines to do it the guys that do a lot more mm -hmm. um, fabric they'll have they'll have that with a yes with uh, the cutter right there. Absolutely absolutely now there are different types of presses um, meaning how <clears throat> the drums um, is heated. This is the heating element that is so crucial for sublimation. You'll hear oil drum or you'll hear electric. So that's the heating element and and the oil drums keep the heat nice and even and consistent across the web or the width of, of the machine so that way you have even results throughout. Yeah. Then you have the electric ones. Yes, there, there have been improvements but it's still very inconsistent. Right. They're much the look. Web. They're much cheaper, very but cheap. there's a reason why. Yes. And you know, if you if you're into it for the long haul, you want to at least set your budget. At least figure for a mid range around thirty thirty five thousand yes. dollars. Um, usually the electrics they're ten sub ten or whatever. And I know it sounds attractive, but as your business grows you will have to get rid of that and get into something yes. else. And so there are, and there are some the electrics that are really, really bad that we see come in that, yeah, you've wasted your money. You're right. looking, pretty much you're going to get it and start looking for another one. Right. There, are, there are some electrics that are much better than others. Right. So, so there are different levels, there, there are different levels. set your expectations. You get it. You get an oil filled, you're fine. Right. There's, there's also radiant heat, which actually I would, yes. I would, Probably put that one step above the electric right. as far as having problems. Right. But uh, I, the getting the oil is where I'd want yes, to be. Yes, yes. Now, I know that there are some oil drums that are coming from overseas that are in the $10,000 range, but, you know, just, just beware. Um, traditionally, oil drums are good, but just look at the reputation of the manufacturer and the support. Well, also the diameter uh, the of, diameter of, of the, the drum, because that's where the difference is. Sometimes you get a small one, it's, it's only five inches, yeah. and then you have another one that's 20 inches. Well, so guess it, what? It, yeah, yeah, it equates to how long the, um, the press time is. When you have something that's small, guess what? It and takes a lot longer You're going to be feeding very slowly, whereas if the drums are bigger, you can feed it faster because you have the big old diameter um, touching, um, touching the fabric for fabric a long period of time. Yep. So, so it's all, it's all, calendaring is one thing, time and temperature and the pressure. Absolutely. And now, temperature, this is where it's critical. And what is this picture of? It is a little temperature recorder strip. Yes. And it's strips. actually um, on the belt of our Cleavric. And then what you want to do is you want to have a minimum of three across the width. And then you're going to put this through the process so it could, you're, you're making sure you're calibrating 
the the heat settings that's on your heat press and making sure that it is accurate. Yes. So as it reaches the correct temperature, the, the little bubbles turn black. So if you have it set to 400 degrees, that four, little 400 degree bubble should be black. Right, and everything underneath, anything lower than that will be black. Right. The, the one thing that you, that's so important on these things are, is if you keep your machine calibrated right, you'll mm -hmm. know everything that's going on. If it can be two things. It can be a problem. If it's an electric one, it could be a coil burnt out. Mm -hmm. It could cause you a problem. Or if it's on a oil drum, something can, something can happen. Every once in a while, they'll get a lock up and all of a sudden the bars bend or something mm -hmm. like that happens and all of a sudden your pressure's not there and it'll also affect the heat. Right, so right. So having these on that will, will help right. tell you, hey, I'm good, nothing happened. We're right. ready to go, and also you'll know if anything's there blocking or, mm -hmm. or having a problem that's making the temperature not constant. Right, and so you want to put these at least six inches in from the edges for yep. each edge, and then one in the middle. And you could also, um, when you can time it, so as it gets closer to the, the drum, the heating element, the oil drum, um, start your timer, and, and when it comes back out, stop your timer. That equates to the dwell time. Right, so you can tell how much time it went through right. on a fabric. That, and then there's help a dial, um, at least on, you know, the cleaver is like a millimeters per second. And, and you know, it's like, gosh, how, how is that 30 seconds of dwell time? So this kind of helps you kind of dial in where on the dial to push things through because setting temperature wise for sublimation, Three, depending, on fa yeah. depending on the fabric, 375 to 400. To 400. Yeah. Pressure, also depending on the fabric. Thickness of the fabrics, mm -hmm. type of fabrics, different pressures. Right. Some you want no pressure. Yeah. yeah. Light and fabrics and things like that, you don't want to be doing it. Heavy fabrics, you need the pressure on it. Right, right. And time, that's where you're, you're kind of trying to calibrate, you know, the, um, the feed through to gauge, you know, 60. 30 to 60 seconds. Right. For and dwell time. Like again, it's time and temperature. Mm -hmm. And this is what everybody does. Mm -hmm. but what you want to be doing here is when you're putting it through the machine, you want it, to, you know, most, most shops say, hey, I only want to have six or eight fabrics. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a sign shop, that's about, they don't want a lot of fabrics right. they have to change out. So if you take each fabric and calibrate it to each one, mm -hmm. know what that time and that temperature is. Yep. And one of the easiest ways journal. of doing it is, <laughs> is, if you've ever burnt a fabric, which we call scorching, when it turns yellow, yeah. that means you've gotten it too hot. Mm -hmm. So the only way to know how, what, what the th on each fabric is, is to get it to the, that yellow scorching. Yeah. Then, then you, you dial, dial it, back. it back. So it's the same color as it went in. Right. Then you know you've got the optimal temperature because it should become out, the, it should go in and out to the highest temperature without scorching it. By doing that, you're going to save a lot of money because by doing that, you're going to get all the dye off of the paper and onto the fabric. Right. So right. it's, I mean, this is, you know, spend one, have your guys spend one afternoon to test all the fabrics mm -hmm. and do this. Just will save swatches. you money like you wouldn't believe in your right. ink costs. And plus, if you scorch it, now your white point is a yellow point. Yeah. <laughs> so it affects your color. And if you ever get something that's scorched, you can wash it in the washing machine, it'll come back out. Right. It, it will. But sometimes you can't wash it when you give it to the customer. No, no, so they, of course. So what they see is right. what, but, yeah. Well, but if you test everything at the beginning, right. you're not going to have to do that. Right, right. And also the pressure, you know, sometimes but, too much pressure or heat, all of a sudden the uh, material that's more of a satin finish right. becomes really, really shiny <laughs> and things like yes, that. Yes, the pressure can, yes, can change. I've seen beautiful fabrics and they come through the, the, the heat press and they've gone too hard or too much pressure and all of a sudden it's just like it's, slimy and this and that. Right. And if you get polyester too hot, it'll get rigid. So it all it affects the hand. So right. there's a point once you go over there, it starts making it stiff. So it's very important to do that. Once you've written down, what you want to do is you want to keep one temperature constant. You don't want to be bringing the machine up and down all day. Right, right. My normal is telling people 380 to, th to 385. Right, it's a good, good, good number. in-between number. And yeah. then just change the, 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 the speed setting. Mm -hmm. So you keep the, co the constant temperature, change, change the, the speed, speed setting. setting, pressure depending if it's uh, a he if it gets real heavy fabric and you mm -hmm. need it for it. But that's it. Write that all down. Have the list. Tell everybody this mm -hmm. is it. There are no deviations. Guess what? You're done. And, and how you actually adjust the pressure is in how you load the fabrics through. They're all with the bars right. as you're feeding the fabric. Um, and so 
more bars, more pressure, less well, bump. Well, the tension. The tension. The tension. tension. I'm sorry. There is a pressure setting. There is too. a pressure setting, but this is the tension. 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 And, what, and what the whole key is, is the less bars you can put it through, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. Because every time you put it through a bar, guess what's happening? You're putting tension on the fabric. Mm -hmm. Putting tension on the fabric is going to stretch the fabric. Right. If you're going in an SCG, it could have a problem with it not going going into the, into the SCG finally mm -hmm. after it sets. If it's apparel, you're changing sizes. Right. So, <laughs> so you don't. Uh, the bars are not your friend. If you yeah. can run it through the machine, just over the bars, and it runs fine, that's what you want to do. Every time you put it through a bar, it's more tension. Yeah. So the least bars you can use, the better off you are. All the bars are there for mm -hmm. is to get out wrinkles. Right. That's it. Right. Okay, so let's go over some of the common issues. So one of the things is stray inks. So say you put something through um, and say, there, and usually there is a protective tissue that goes on the belt. And that's just, um, some people say they don't use it, but I always tell them, please do. Because if there are any stray inks, you want it on the tissue paper, not on the belt. The belt is very, 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 very expensive. And to replace a belt, it is a long, 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 long ordeal. And you're going to take apart the, the whole machine on, on a lot of machines. And, and you're going to you know, replace the whole belt. And then you, you can't just use a new belt. It has to be conditioned to get the, the shrinkage and whatever. So that takes has time. To run, yes. So it has to run. So protect that belt. Eventually, it will wear. But... Yeah, you, you don't, you don't want, want to, be, to yeah. wear it too quickly. Yeah, you sh it, should, it should last a long time. And right. also, if you're, look, your whole life depends on that machine. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have a spare belt. Yes. Because if you don't have one and something happens. It's not like they just not, pull it off the shelf. Yeah, and sometimes they're, they're not on the shelf. Right, right. Depending on what happens worldwide, they keep, they keep mm -hmm. extras. But I've, I've heard, you know, I've had many customers in big problems and trying to borrow a belt from another person that has right. that machine right. that does it. So please make sure that you always have that. And the other thing that happens, if a machine loses, yes. loses power. Very important. Train the belt, employees. Yes. You need to know how to keep that belt moving. Right. Different machines have different ways of doing it. There are some machines that can actually take the pressure off of it mm -hmm. and take it off of the heat. Right. Other ones you can't. You have to keep it going. They have a hand crank that you have to crank on there. Right. Because you want to move that belt away <clears throat> from the heating element because it's at It'll burn. 400 degrees. It's and if it burn. just sits there, it's going to burn. In two or three minutes, you're, you've ruined your belt. So. And, yeah, and, and it's not covered under warranty. This no. is a consumable. So. so if you lose power, everybody in your place, and don't make it just your, your one guy knows this, everybody that has to do with that machine should know how, where, to. how to do it, how to keep it going, and how to crank it. That should be a thing where right. you gather up everybody that could possibly be there and show them how to run it because you don't want to be replacing the belt. Right. And so when you protect, use protective paper, if any inks uh, go, uh, it will just deposit on the paper and, and it's gone. So when you start a new job, those stray inks, if it's left on the belt, guess what? It's now going to go into your new um, design or right. your new job. And then it could redeposit in another job. Yeah, it keeps redepositing, so it keeps want, sublimating. You want that belt pristine. The cheapest thing is to buy the tissue paper. Yes. Even, yeah, so some people say, oh, we don't need it. No, be, be, just be on the safe side. Use a tissue paper. And then you can use that tissue paper when you're, uh, with, for your customers when you're rolling up things yes, to send out. Yes, it makes a great protective paper. Yep. All right, another issue, and we alluded to this as well uh, as we were looking at defects are lint and debris on the fabric. So make sure it's nice and clean because if you don't have it clean, the inks will now sublimate onto the lint, and when you you know, pick off the lint or whatever debris, now you have that white spot where the lint was. Yes. Or if there's a wrinkle or whatever, so just make sure. Yeah, good housekeeping. You know, you, yeah. don't, you don't want to be on your heat press and go there and there's, there, there, there's lint all over the top of the right, machine. Right, right. You make sure that everybody does it. You set up an, you gotta set up a, an airline there so they can blow down the machine yes. on a daily use and keep it clean. Absolutely. And this we spoke to in regards to the tension, the image is distorted. Um, I, I heard a story from a gentleman who, is, uh, who has been doing this a long time, but when he first started out, had some stretchy material, added too much tension. It just stretched to the point and say a circle image became an and oval. Then, yep. <laughs> so, yeah, he was thinking, yeah, we're keeping the tension, we're keeping everything nice. At the, you know, once the, everything goes through to the take up, it was just, he it induced so much stretch at the beginning and at the end that 
you know, just too much tension. So. You, you just triggered something. One of the things you can always do if you want to check to see what it is, if you do a circle, <laughs> it should be a circle when it comes out. If you put it through your machine and that circle's an egg, then yeah. you know you've got way too much tension. Right. So if there's ever a situation, print a circle, run it through the machine, and see what it looks like. And if it comes out as a circle, you've got the right tension. Right. And if it's an egg, we got you got a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that way you dial it in and you note it. So no yeah. such thing as too much information in my book. All right. Another issue, underdeveloped shades. So, and, you know, the image on the left, you can see, like, the blues and then the black, even the reds, but you can see it more so in right. the slide, the blue. Uh, it's not as vibrant as it should be. Right. And so. the last thing you want to do is leave your money mm -hmm. on the paper. Right. And, and you'll see the ink still on the paper. Exactly. So, and if, if everything else, if this paper normally transfers and releases, say, you know, 90% of the inks, and all of a sudden you have, you don't have that transfer, you're leaving that paper. You need more heat to, for those inks to release right. off the paper and, yes. you know, sublime into Yeah, if you, if you ever see a lot of color all left on your paper, yeah. you got a problem. And right. You, and that's, and that's, that's your money just going in the trash can. But, you know, we sell ink, so we're good. We're good with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no. No, that's all joking aside. Sometimes when you have good quality inks, a little bit goes a long ways, and we'll, we'll go over that um, later in the, in the next um, section of this series. <clears throat> ghosting. Uh, we had a lot of questions on how to prevent ghosting. Is that blurred, double image? Um, you know, it could be a lot. It's... Bottom line is, there's movement. Fabric shrinking, paper shrinking. Something's going something on. Something shrinking. There's, there's movement. So, so the inks um, are, are kind of shifting in as it settles. So it could be you have too much inks on yep. your paper. Maybe you know, there, there's or something going on. Too much pressure. Too there, much yeah. pressure. So there, if you ever see it, yes, you have mm -hmm. to go look around and see what, what's causing the issues. Right, right. So ghosting is very common. And then as you're, you're troubleshooting, just change one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't, so that way you can pinpoint, okay, well, you know what? The ink limit's fine. That's not the issue. Um, then you measure you know, the shrinkage. and it's, yeah, so just Right, if the fabric's moving, the paper's moving. Right. It could be, a, it could be multiple things that are going on. So, mm -hmm. you know, set up your systems. Once mm -hmm. you've got a system in place and, the, and everything done and everybody knows this is what they're supposed to do, it, run, it runs easy. Right, right. And boat wake patterns. So you're going to see that in the paper where it just has this, you know. Yep, or cockling. Cockling and stuff. And that's going to transfer into your sublimated fabric. So, you know, check again, ink limit. Too much ink limit or, you know, too high of an ink limit. Um, has the paper properly dried? Have you put so much ink on the paper that the paper's not drying? Something's happening that's causing that cockling boat wave type. How, how, the, how the paper was stored. Right. If it has a lot, it of, moist, a lot of moisture. A lot of moisture. It. You're in some, you know, you're in the south, you're in Florida. The, humid, the yeah. humidity gets in there and it gets loaded up. You're going to get cockling. Right, right. So um, just condition. condition. Condition and storage. Yes, yes. Very important. See how everything ties in together. <laughs> There's a purpose behind our process. All right, wrinkles across the web. So once again, making sure there's even tension. Is it the fabric? Are there wrinkles in it? Is, is it the roll of, of printed paper mm -hmm. itself? You know, is it the transfer paper? So it, it's just, you know. There's lots of different things. And then on some fabrics, they, we, you can even take them and we, if it's really, really moving around, mm -hmm. like, a, like something for a scarf fabric. Like a sheer shears, material. Sometimes you have to paper back them depending mm -hmm. on the machine that it's going into, and the press and all the different right. things. So that's one way of doing it is getting it, uh, putting an adhesive paper on it, and then you can run it through the machine without it moving at all, and then you just, it just releases right, right after it gets printed. So absolutely. that's something else you can look into. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, another common banding. So once again, you know, is a paper dry, you, the printed paper itself, you know, sometimes there's some micro banding that when you, you print, you see the little micro banding, and you know what, sometimes with sublimation, those sublimate out, so you don't see it. But these are just the larger banding that's not so much, in, you know, from the printing. So now yeah. it's just a matter of, you know, and was just, there so much ink that now instead of the, and, and the paper itself. Paper itself. It's so overloaded. Now everything's kind of spilling over. 
and stuff. Right, but you just got to be careful that the banding isn't caused by a head strike or you're not having the right profile. Right, that right. It's doing it. There's, there's different ways that the banding shows up. So Right, different uh, types of banding, small bandings, where maybe you're not printing with a high number of passes and, mm -hmm. and the resolution. Maybe you were printing at two pass. 540 by 360, and you and say you print three or four pass, and okay, banding's gone, and, and you see the results of it. And, and, and where it really shows up is when you're doing a blotch. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of the prints, you, you wouldn't see it at all, but when you're doing a blotch, especially if it's black. Oh, yes, the big old. Black's the worst, and then the royals and the reds, but that's when you'll see it. And right. something like this, where you have a lot of yellow, you're seeing it there too. But mm -hmm. it's, it's normally the, when you, whenever it shows up is when you're doing blotches. Right, which right. Which a blotches full coverage print. Right, right. And when you have something that's busy and whatever, it, it gets disguised. Right. So, so just check and see. All right. No, the last one we're going to go through, um, shading. Or there's different ways of, yeah, this is where, like, say you have, like, it, it looks like, these little vapor marks, you know, look at the word ethics and, and stuff. You can see, you know, there's a little bit of almost like steam marks going out and, and stuff like that, where it's not nice, crisp, you know, fine details. So once again, you start ink limit. Are you laying so much ink there that, you know what, it has penetrated the fabric. Mm -hmm. It's got nowhere else to go. So, so it's got to go somewhere. Uh, it, it's some still left on the, the paper and you're still putting it through the heat. Well, the ink has to go somewhere. So that's where you're seeing some of that pattern. And Sometimes stuff. it can also be if the, if the fabric hasn't been shrunk properly. Yes. It'll do that when you're sublimating. You'll see it grow like right. that. So that, that could also be a cause of it too. Right. And, and, what, and like you're saying, um, even if there's like silicone or some mm -hmm. finishing that's added to yeah. it, most of the time, uh, and that was one of the questions we had is, could finishes um, added you know, to the fabric, could that affect your end results? And it can. Right. It can. Most of the time, it, it shouldn't. Um, optical brighteners, how does that affect your, your it, end it, results? It wouldn't really have an issue on that. The mm -hmm. optical brighteners will have how, how, how it, it looks, looks and, and, the and, and, the, and the flare. Mm -hmm. But... Um, most of the time with this, it, it ha has a lot to, sometimes to do with the shrinkage of the fabric yeah. itself. So right. that's where sometimes, especially with stretch fabrics, mm -hmm. depending on how you do, again, right. no bars. If you can you do it, no tension. Right, right. All right, so we went through quite a bit of different common issues and calendars and things to look at. And, but, so stay tuned for the fifth our second to last webinar, webinar in this six part series. So we're going to go over sublimation process again, but we're going to look into profiles, inks, and paper and how these affect your sublimation process and the outcome. So stay tuned and thank you so much. Thank you very much.